Pope Francis made the news a couple of weeks ago when he released a small instruction called Fiducia Supplicants, suggesting that or instructing that certain kinds of blessings could be given to same-sex couples and couples in irregular relationships in certain circumstances. It caused a whole lot of outrage. But in fact, it was a very tame law document that didn't actually change very much. And there's not much I can, I can do with a blessing or not do now that I couldn't do two weeks ago. What Pope Francis was saying was if a, couple, if a couple of people approach a priest or a deacon asking for a blessing because they've got a new house or there's some sickness in the family or they're traveling, the kind of things that many married couples come and ask a, a prayer blessing for, that whether that couple is a man and woman who are sacramentally married or whether they're civilly married or cohabiting or whether they're a same-sex couple or a same-sex uh, civil relationship, that we don't have to apply a, regular, a rigorous moral scrutiny to saying, does this person deserve a blessing or not? We can simply offer a person a blessing if they, if they come openly, with their hearts open, desiring God to act in their life, no matter what their circumstances may be. It was that simple. But it caused a great reaction because for some people, I think, who'd probably read the headlines before they read the document, any outreach towards the LGBT or same-sex community, any seeming uh, appeasement, any seeming offering openness and kindness to them is often met with great, uh, great backlash, seen as being somehow a travesty of Catholic moral teaching. Where in fact, Pope Francis declared nothing has changed in the te church's teaching on marriage. It's just Pope Francis' method of applying moral teaching a little more gently, a little more inclusively. And you might wonder, well, why am I speaking on this? On this feast of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary and Joseph in the week after Christmas? Well, to say that I think it's worth calling out sometimes that the great reaction and great opposition we often see to same-sex people and to the LGBT community from the church I think is a smokescreen. I think it's often held up that, that this community and these people are somehow a threat to Catholic Christian sacramental marriage. And I just want to say, I don't think that's true at all. It's really easy to scapegoat another group of outsiders and make them the threat, make them the challenge, because that absolves me of anything I have to do to change myself. It absolves me of any need to be open to my own conversion. Now, I'm not saying there are no threats to marriage. There are threats and challenges to marriage very, very much that we need to deal with head on. But what are those challenges? I think the greatest challenges facing marriage and family today are materialism and busyness. I wonder if you'd agree. So let's have a look at them together. Materialism is something we are all immersed in. Our culture is a highly material, materialist one that, that I'm part of. So I have to deal with, I have to reflect on how do I deal with this in my life? How do I buy into our culture? And how does that spill into perhaps my family life? There is no doubt that the cost of living is increasing, that the cost of renting or buying a house is, is going up and up. And that causes great pressure on so many people. But we've got to remember though, that buying a house is hard today but it was hard 20 and 30 years ago. It was hard 30 years ago when interest rates were 15 to 18%. Our parents did it tough as well. It's been a constant, I guess. And yes, there are particular challenges right now. But we all, what we also have to recognise, though, is the expectations and the standard of living has gone up incredibly as well. That we expect that we should buy the, any, any new house or apartment we buy today might A, be brand new, that it would have en suites, it would be fully air conditioned, it would have secure lock up parking, probably for a couple of cars. Whereas our parents bought, often bought two bedroom fibro shacks with an outside toilet. Now, now those, those two bedroom fibro shacks, they're pretty hard to come by, and the ones that are have been eyed off by developers, admittedly. But again, just to acknowledge that yes, it's expensive to buy, but what we get is better than our, than our parents and grandparents ever had or even imagined. So firstly, to own that, the material standard of living has increased incredibly, and we are part of that culture. But given, that's, but given that, is, that is true, it does create, place, I guess, incredible strain and stress on couples wanting to buy a property. It means that almost inevitably, both husband and wife will need to both work to work to, to afford the mortgage, and they'll have to both work l big jobs and long hours. That places pressures on a marriage. Financial stress is one of the biggest uh, is one of the biggest factors for for distress in marriage these days. But the long hours take a toll as well. The high expectations and demands. Many jobs involve travelling uh, these days, travelling away from the family home as well for extended periods. Again, that's a disruption of family life, but seems to be an expectation of a of a high paced corporate culture. And then once, once a family has children, often the children are timetabled into when can the career break be taken. And that's unfortunately a bit of a reality, but awful though that, that, that choosing to have a child would be secondary to any other factor. 
And when the children are growing up then, then so much of the child rearing has to be, and the care has to be outsourced to somebody else so that the parents can get back to work to keep on paying that big mortgage. And again, that goes on and on. But then when, as the children then begin to grow up, often the parents will, I think, almost overcompensate by trying to offer the children more. Every, every parent I talk to says, I want to give my kids everything. And the everything sometimes includes some material things, but increasingly our materialism is not just stuff, it's experiences, it's adventures. So parents want to give their children all the, all the sports, all the dance, all the travel, all the, all the tutoring. Even tutoring is an example of something that used to be remedial. It used to be to help kids who are below average get up to an average level of success. Now tutoring for many people is a standard thing that average kids do to get into higher echelons and for some crack at some greater success. And so the pressure goes on. And so for many families, it's the parents who are busy working, but the kids who are busy with their activities as well. And so much of family life gets reduced to ferrying kids around to their many program activities. There's not a lot of downtime for families just to be families together. And that, I think, is that one of the great burdens and pressures that so many of our families do face today. But I do believe there are ways we can be creative to respond to that. I have no examples from my own life. As a single man, I have no credibility on this subject. And as a priest who gets to live in the house next door to the church rent-free, I have no standing to talk about the cost of living crisis. But I want to share with you a couple of quick stories of families I know who have taken really creative solutions to improve their family life, despite the challenges we all face. My friends Dave and Rachel, when they were first married and had two young kids, realised that they could not afford to buy a house in Sydney and live on one wage and be present to their children. So they decided they would move somewhere away where they could afford to do that. And they found that in the end in Hobart, where Dave could ride his bike to work and leave, at home, leave home at eight and be back at six and see his kids in daylight hours. And Rachel could be a full-time mum to their then three children. They spent 10 years doing that, really, really hard work, having moved away from their family supports in Sydney, moving to a town where they knew no one else, but forming a new family life focused just on each other and their children and relying on each other there. And 20 years later, as those children have now, well, many years later, as those children have now grown up as teenagers, I can see in them the quality of that, that intensive, loving parenting. Those children know that they were put first above all things, and their parents have made sacrifices for them. Another great family I knew with, with older teenage kids realised that life was getting so busy with their kids' sports and activities and part-time jobs, they were never going to have a meal together as a family anymore. So they made the really creative decision to say, let's make breakfast the family meal each day. Every day became a sit-down, cooked, hot breakfast around the dining table. So they had time to sit and talk, laugh and argue as a family. And I can hear the, the, the non-mourning people kind of recoiling at, at the, the thought of that, but that's a sacrifice this family made, to sacrifice a bit of comfort and have early mornings so they had time as a family. Another thing they did too was they did not buy a dishwasher. They didn't just pack the dishes in the dishwasher and go off to work. They had a roster where it was one parent and one child standing shoulder to shoulder at the sink to do the washing and drying up together to create that lovely one-on-one -on -one dynamic of each parent talking to each child each week. Because we know often kids respond better shoulder to shoulder than face to face, especially as they get older. So these are just a couple of great families I've seen who found great creative responses to prioritise their family life over other things. What if, you, what if you're not married though? What if you're younger and you think, well, what's this got to do with me? Let me tell you about my friend Ben, who got a, a job in high school and worked that same job all the way through high school and uni. Ben, so you say making money, saving money, but Ben didn't drink, didn't really go out much, didn't go out late at night and get taxis home, didn't buy junk food, didn't go big travelling holidays. So he didn't really do much, didn't spend much money. So what he did is he just saved and saved for a house. So by the time he finished uni and got his first full-time job, he had enough money to put down a deposit on a house, which he then did and began paying off. And I look at Ben now and think, well, Ben's not yet married, but he will be one day. And, the, and the, I guess the, the, the hard work and the sacrifices he made in his first few, uh, first few years will give him and his future wife and family so many more options for how they will manage their work and their life together. They'll have far fewer financial pressures because they'll have the deposit already. They'll already have some equity in their home, which gives them freedom to choose who works and when and how long. And they're just three examples, I guess, I think, of things that people can do to prioritise family life. And this week of the Feast of the Holy Family, we talk about the dignity of, of families through the lens of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. And as a church, we say that family is the central unit of, of, of the society, not the individual. 
to say the individual is, is centre or prime is the modern Western post-enlightenment neoliberal approach where, where individual rights and needs are paramount. But that's not the Catholic worldview. But paradoxically though, people who champion their own rights then often also rely on the, the state and the government to provide all the other services to allow them to maintain their individuality. And that's not our response either. To say that the, the, the society is central is really the communist social approach and we don't take that either. No, we say that family is the place that God has designed for virtue to be grown, for character to be formed, for sacrificial love to be given and received and shared and grown, and in doing so, holiness emerges. Family is meant to be a place where holiness grows. We call family the domestic church, where the love between spouses and the love between parents and children is what grows into being the people God makes us to be. It's not easy. Families always have struggles. But in those struggles, in bearing them together and seeking God's help and grace for family life, then we grow to be the people God wants us to be. 2,000 years ago, God entered humanity in and through a family, Jesus being born to Mary and Joseph. God still wants to come to us in our family life today to grow us in virtue and love and holiness.